creating specifications for the phone so that they cannot be used on any other network. Um, and that's not before us here, I understand that. But it does show um, a tendency or practice of the largest carriers to um, uh, exclude competitive uh, uh, opportunities from all of the carriers. Uh, unlocking uh, of handsets of the iconic devices that the carriers, the largest carriers have exclusive rights to uh, continues to be uh, a difficulty, to create a difficulty for small carriers getting access to, to those devices, even if they were to purchase them from the OEMs. So at least we know that that is not a policy of AT&T to unlock their um, exclusive handsets um, that I'm aware of. There's also some iPads that um, you could say that are locked and, and cannot operate on another uh, network. Um, I, I think the, the reason for that may be uh, more how they're designed technically uh, on purpose than uh, just a mere unlocking um, uh, uh, process. But uh, again, uh, the largest carriers have shown a great propensity to ensure that their unique devices are in fact, are in fact not available to other, uh, uh, for other competitive uh, carriers to, to utilize. And on T-Mobile itself, I understand T-Mobile uh, does uh, value the, the benefit. I think there's over 1.2 million uh, unlocked devices on the T-Mobile network now. And uh, as, of, as of the time that we filed our comments, which was the beginning of March, um, even if you purchased an unlocked iPhone for us directly, I'm sorry, directly from Apple, uh, it still would only be unlocked for GSM networks and not for CMA. Um, so I, I, I mean, unless that's changed in the past few months, it's, although the phone has the hardware capability to connect to both GSM networks and CMA networks, it's my understanding that if you purchase a phone unlocked, quote, unlocked from the Apple Store, it's not fully unlocked. Let's move on to another topic. Um, <clears throat> one of the basic things one has to address in this rulemaking is whether the use in question is a non-infringing use. I may have missed it, Bruce, but I don't think I identified, I identified anything in your comments pointing out to any of the desired uses that the proponents are suggesting uh, are, dri are the driving force behind this request for an exemption. And any of those uses are infringing. Uh, but I may have missed it, so here's your opportunity to tell me how what they want to do would result in acts of infringement. Sure. Um, when you turn on a cell phone, you typically need to copy significant chunks, if not all of the operating system into RAM, and that is making a copy. Uh, and the making of that copy, putting aside the issue over Section 117, which we cannot discuss separately, but the making of that copy has uniformly been held to be within the scope of the rights of the copyright owner. And the agreements uh, that are in the record typically limit, and, and I can expand on those with respect to those that aren't in the record, uh, but at least of the carriers that I have described today, typically limit the authorization that's granted by the licenses to the use of the software in connection with the carrier's service, so that making the reproduction of that software uh, is infringing. Did we argue that explicitly in our comments? No, because none of the proponents in their opening case made the, made the argument that that wasn't infringing. I, I saw other arguments made. We responded to the arguments where they have the burden of proof. Uh, we can certainly and I'm making that point now, and it's consistent with, the com with what we have in our comments where we take the position that the uses are infringing uses, but it does come from the reproduction of the operating system into the uh, RAM of the phone. Okay, let's turn to that bit. Um, 117 is obviously another issue, and Bruce's point of view on how it works probably different from yours, but without getting into that, and we may get into it later, um, is it your position that apart from Section 117, the act of 
turning on your cell phone and loading the operating system when you are using it with a network other than the network that your license uh, permits you to use it on is or is not an infringing act? It's our position that that is a non-infringing act, um, in large part because of, we believe that the terms of the of the, service, of the software license agreement that would prohibit a user from turning on the cell phone that he or she has purchased, uh, has lawfully purchased with the software already installed on it after connecting to another network would be an, an unenforceable term of the contract um, due to the doctrine. So, and I assume you're, I believe you're also relying on Section 117, correct? Yes, in part. Okay, so 117, copyright misuse, are those, the, are those the only two reasons why you would say that that use is not infringing? Well, we also, so my understanding is that you're, you're discussing now after the software has already been altered, just turn on the phone? Well, I don't think we're just talking about alteration, alteration, although we certainly understand that's one scenario. Well, sorry, we were talking over each sorry. other, so why don't, you, why don't you repeat what you said so the reporter gets it all and then I'll, I'll respond. Sorry, so the other, the other portion of our argument about why unlocking a phone and using it to connect to another character's network constitutes a non-infringing use is because um, the, <coughs> the reflashing a phone and injecting a particular, I'm sorry, this is, yeah, I'm not a technologist and it's difficult for me to talk about these issues. But um, overwriting some of the variables that the software uses to connect to a carrier's network with different variables to enable it to connect to another carrier's network uh, are alterations, if you'd like to call them that, that do not rise to the level of constituting a derivative work. So the derivative, we believe that the derivative work right is not, um, is not infringed. And uh, we believe that the reproduction right is not infringed. So you're saying when you flash, you clear out all those variables, leave the blank slate, and then you impose your own variables by when you switch to the network with a new kind of system to use that phone at that network. Yes, and that those variables themselves are unprotected. Okay, we've gotten in the, um, into the question of derivative works. Bruce, you wanna, you wanna, you wanna speak to that issue? I do, I, I, I should have added that. Remember in my testimony in chief, I, I spoke about both the error of focusing, the fact that you need to be non-infringing in two respects. First, you need to be non-infringing in the context of the act of circumvention. And I identified two situations understanding that there are modifications that are infringing modifications. One of those is the typical means by which iPhones are uh, unlocked, which involves changing either the Google Letter software, the operating system software, in ways that go, in terms of their authentication functionality, in ways that go beyond mere addition of variables. Uh, secondly, I believe that's also the case with respect to the track phone proprietary engine. But when you get beyond the question of the act of circumvention, the, the second order question is whether the use of the software after it has been unlocked, in other words, after these variables have been changed, is infringing. And I don't think Ms. Moy addresses that issue when she argues that simply changing variables or reflashing those non-infringing. It may be that in certain circumstances the act of circumvention is non-infringing, but again, that's not primarily the right question. The right question is whether the use of copyrighted work after it has been unlocked is infringing, and that doesn't go to that point. And, and the right you're referring to in that latter case is, again, the reproduction right, I assume. Is that correct? In the latter case, yes. Okay. Um, all right. In, in the form
former cases. Any more comments on reproduction right, derivative work right, from anyone? No, I, I, you know, I'm not a patent expert on it, but I clearly no this room is, I suspect. <laughs> <laughs> don't believe that uh, we're talking about it in, uh, an infringing act. And uh, in my mind, you, you unlock the, the handset, which is under the exemption, and you utilize uh, the device on another network. And it's fairly, I mean, it's fairly focused, very narrow, and you use the device as uh, you had used it earlier. Um, it, th there can there can be you know uh, additional data that you may have to to um, to use in the, in, the, in the process of unlocking the device. Uh, you know, as everyone gets smarter on how they protect their uh, device and keep it to, from being unlocked, which we talked a little about technological innovation. Um, the main purpose and the main focus of the exemption is very narrow and very specific. And I, um, I, I don't know that that uh, you get to that point uh, of uh, a full utilization of uh, beyond a 117 uh, work. Right. Um, sorry, I have, a, I have a quick question here, which is, so then, so then Mr. Joseph, am I, am I clear in thinking that it's your position that if a user of a mobile device has an unlocked device and is using that device currently to connect to a network that has not been in the network, that, that the consumer is engaging in copyright infringement? That would depend on the terms of the license governing the software that the consumer is using, whether the consumer is a licensee, and whether the action Since the carrier is the party that granted the license, it is not infringing when the carrier unlocks the phone for its licensee uh, for use on other networks. That's, if not explicitly authorized, implicitly authorized. Okay, let's talk about the licenses. Um, Bruce, you've given us examples of four customer agreements, one from each of the major carriers. Uh, but it's not clear to me whether those four provisions you've given us are standard provisions in all contracts for all four of the major carriers, or are these just examples of certain contracts when there may be all sorts of variations that go off in different directions? I believe those are the standard terms of service that would apply generally. provisions in license agreements. Someone who bought a cell phone which had the software on it would in fact own the copy of that software that was on the cell phone? Or for instance, the uh, purchaser of the phone. Am I 
purchaser of the phone gives the uh, gives the phone away, um, so there's no longer any privity for that contract. And then you're confusing, I would respectfully say, copyright infringement with breach of contract. Uh, when the software is distributed subject to a license, the licensee has no greater authority to give rights in the licensed software to a third party than the copyright owner, than the licensee has acquired. That's fundamental copyright law. And with respect to the standard terms of service, those are not the same as the term contract provision. Their term persists for the time you have the loan. They, they don't expire at the end. If you have a two-year contract where you're paying a given fee for two years, the standard, the terms of service that govern your use and the license to the software don't, ex don't expire uh, with the term contract. So I think they're confusing a couple of issues embedded in your question. Well, so who would be the infringer in that case? So if the phone's given away, you're saying the person who, who then turns the phone on was not subject to any license is infringing the copyright. Uh, they would be uh, the infringer, yes. Can I just um, follow up on, on this line of question, Bruce, for this? So this is a hypothetical. I have a phone and I throw it away with the owner of the copyright work or the licensee have any suit against me for destroying his property if you believe that it's just a license rather than ownership of that particular phone? As a general rule, no, because typically there's not an obligated destruction of the phone is one of the contemplated outcomes and there's not an obligation to return the phone in all cases. And, and by the way, I, I was uh, to, to amend I think my answer was right vis-a-vis -vis the acquirer of the phone, even in the absence of binding terms of service. And I think I'll stop there, actually. Okay, so um, question for everyone then. Do we have any evidence in the record before us that any significant numbers of purchasers of locked cell phones actually do own the copies of the software on them. Another way of putting that is, uh, do we have any evidence that any significant number of people who purchase cell phones do so without uh, being subject to license terms, such as the terms that were recited in the CTIA comment? My quick answer is no, I believe there's no evidence. This is a, a sort of a servitude uh, or a, a chattel uh, theory of uh, you know what right do you have to something that you have in your hand, um, and if it works, it works. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if anyone knows. Even the carriers uh, th clearly understand if they have a right to that s hardware software uh, together that when you turn it on, it works. I, you know, I. I'm not so sure that there's an easy answer. I don't know of anything in the record that that, that 
speaks to that uh, you know, profound. Well, I, think that, I think that there's also the to a license agreement which made it quite clear that the owner of that device did not own the copy of the software that was on the device. When that person sold that device to a third party, how could the third party suddenly get more rights than the original person, the original owner had? I, I had a contract with Verizon. I sell that phone to you. I didn't own the copy of the software on the phone. So how is it that you own the copy of the software on the phone after I sold the phone to you? She looks like you want to answer for her. No, I don't. I, just want to ask. I, think, I think your question captures it brilliantly and precisely, but I would then simply amplify. Moreover, the first sale doctrine also only applies to owners of copies. It doesn't apply to licensees of copies. So the first sale doctrine suffers from the same defect as the Section 117 argument. Right. One issue that I'm surprised I didn't see a whole lot of discussion on in the comments, given the amount of time we spent on it last time around and the changes that have occurred since that time has to do with case law in the Ninth Circuit. Um, my recollection of what we said three years ago, two years ago, was essentially that <coughs> the law is pretty unclear with respect to uh, what the status is of uh, who owns, wh whether one owns the copy of software when one obtains it pursuant to a license, and that issue was in fact before the Ninth Circuit. One of our problems was we couldn't predict how the Ninth Circuit was going to rule, so we were dealing with uh, a relative paucity of cases, but also cases that went in both directions. Uh, like it or not, and some may, some may not, the Ninth Circuit has now spoken, but I don't know that any of you have really spoken real clearly as to what the implications are of the rulings in the Ninth Circuit, and since we spent so much time worrying about them last time around, it would be nice to have some help on what lessons we should draw from the Ninth Circuit rulings, if any. Bruce? I thought we actually did address that issue in our written comments, which is, of course, where most of our yep. position is laid out, uh, and it, it's argued that the Ninth Circuit, which in a particular case found the copies at issue to have been licensed rather than sold, uh, that the holding of the Ninth Circuit is consistent with our position that uh, software on mobile phones typically is licensed. And uh, at the examples of the agreements that we cite, we think support that. Now, to be fair, the Ninth Circuit didn't go into an added uh, characteristic that is common in the wireless terms of service, which is the right to modify at will by the carrier the, the software, which I think is a further indicia of license rather than ownership in the licensing. So would anyone on that side of the table like to address for us what implications we should draw from the Ninth Circuit to William Werner? I've had some help here uh, to uh, point at page 16 of the Metro's reply comments, uh, and we can certainly supplement uh, that particular section uh, more fulsome. But, uh, I think it's also uh, uh, fairly well, uh, well, I'd, I'd say it's addressed, but I, I would like to supplement that for the record. Anyone have a question? Sure. So I have some questions for both sides here. We'll start with you, Laura. Tell me why anyone would want to use a tablet on another network. I'm trying to wrap my head around the expansion that you have requested. Um, I see it's clear that you want to use another mobile carrier for voice services for all sorts of reasons. 
I'm still unclear as to why someone would want to switch anything but their mobile phone device to another network. So please let me know what the reasons would be and why we should entertain your exemption as written. I mean, I think, I think that there are a number of reasons. not just for voice services, but also for data. And uh, it may have to do with coverage of the network or with customer service. Um, <coughs> maybe just a, a, a personal relationship that an individual consumer has with a particular carrier that is either positive or negative. That, um, that, you know, and these, are, these, are the, these are the sorts of things that influence consumers' decisions to sign up with one carrier or another in the first place. And they're the same sorts of considerations that Are there any terms of service that we should be aware of as there were for voice services that apply to the switching of tablets for data services that should be part of the record or we should know about? Well, I, you know, I'm sort of struck by your distinction between you know, voice and data when we're moving into a 3G and 4G world where voice is data and many of the devices that you currently have are voice voice of internet protocol uh, you know, uh, signals. So it, it, it's, a, a bit, it's, it's a bit uh, sort of concept, it, whether it's voice, whether it's data, whether it's uh, uh, video, it, it's, all, it's all bits of data. So um, you know, the, in that respect, uh, a wireless tablet is, is uh, a wireless device. That's why we suggest that you should identify wireless devices. Um, and many of the suggestions from Laura have, are correct. What if you, you have a, a device, you get transferred uh, from Washington DC area to the, to, the, um, to the Texas area and you want a different carrier because they have better coverage in that area. Uh, most tablets right now, you're already switching to hotspots or Wi-Fi uh, offload type of situation. So if it's your host carrier, if you want to change, then um, uh, you should have that same right. Uh, it is a, a wireless device that transmits data, whether it's turned into voice or whether it's, you know, a video or whether it's something else. I, that's why we suggest that we expand the, uh, the understanding. Uh, it means a lot in the telecom world, uh, whether it's a, you know, telecommunication service or an information service. I'm not so sure that those distinctions uh, are relevant, particularly in the copyright world. But I think it certainly is a, uh, easier to understand the types of devices we're talking about if you say wireless device. Well, I just want to note, I think it's the burden is on the proponents here to show why there should be an expansion because it, at least as I understood it, the current exemption is, has been traditionally understood to apply to what we know as voice service. The whole reason for switching is maybe you don't like the service that the current carrier has, but it was really in the context of what we knew in 2006 and 2010. So if you're looking to see a revision of it, then you have to show us exactly why we should entertain that. One of the reasons why I was asking those questions. Well, let me jump in on that, because one of the questions I wanted to ask was, what evidence do we have in the record that access controls are in fact used to lock tablets, notebook computers, e-readers, any mobile devices other than what have typically been understood to be cell phones? Well, as, as we pointed out in our reply comments, um, that when you purchase, for example, an iPad in the Apple Store, you're required to select a carrier before checking out. And the consumer is informed during the checkout process that your iPad will work only with the carrier you choose. Um, so we know that they are being sold locked. Um, well, wait a minute. Are, uh, hold on. How do we know that? What you just told us doesn't tell me that they're locked. Do you know what kind of access control, if any, is, is, is put on the, uh, on the iPad? I, I'm sorry, I was referring to any, I mean, any type of access control that restricts it to one particular carrier. But what you, what you recited a moment ago did not in any respect say there is an access control on it. It said you won't be able to use it somewhere else. I don't know why you can't use it somewhere else. Maybe it's just totally incompatible software. I just don't know. But my, my specific question is what evidence do we have? that access controls are used on these other devices because we have no evidence. I think the I think game's over on that front. And I, you know, related to that, I think it's um, this 
contractual. I mean, I don't see anything that locks you down. I think it's just a matter of signing an agreement. And I don't that's, know. That's, and that's why I was asking this line of question with regard to everything but what we know of today. And, and um, I, I know that Samsung uh, Notebook, some of the Xbox, some of the other devices are locked, and we can provide you information uh, in that regard. I think it's referred to uh, in, in yeah, I think in a footnote, but uh, we can provide you additional information. But uh, it, again, I'm still sort of struck with your question that uh, you're talking about telephonic, i.e., you know, voice only when the, in the wireless world, there literally is no distinction between uh, a analog voice, traditional analog voice, um, you know, connection and a data connection. Uh, especially when you're, we're already in the voice, voice of internet protocol, we'll be in the 4G LT, which is all data. Uh, and uh, and, I, it, it, and then the, the wireless devices, the tablets and the other devices are, are following along the same uh, traditional path that uh, carriers have, uh, have looked to, uh, to block devices in order to access their network. It's the same, I won't say it's the same protocol, but it's the same type of, of uh, uh, network access regime. And that's what we're suggesting uh, should be covered on the exemption uh, and um, should uh, be, uh, it, the, the, the language should be modified so that it's clear that we're talking about wireless devices. And many of the phones that you refer to now are actually smartphones that are um, much more than than voice. As a matter of fact, uh, most people would tell you a smartphone spends seventy percent of its life and, uh, in some other data uh, consumption form other than a voice conversation. But is there any evidence that anyone is confused by the reference in the current exemption to uh, what is what's the word handset? Is that I think? Uh, is there any evidence that anyone believes that smartphones are not within the scope of that? I certainly don't, but I also uh, look at uh, the wireless device world maybe a little different than, than you do. Uh, you can make telephone calls, you can have video, Skype, uh, you know, face-to-face -face phone calls over a, over a, a wireless uh, you know, iPad or a, a, a tablet, uh, just like you have a phone call. And so the difference, I think, is, uh, at least for me, sort of escapes Excuse me as a major difference between uh, a telephone, i.e. wireless phone, as it's matured and developed and the, and the functionality uh, continues to, to grow as technology develops. I mean, I, just speaking of the record, just didn't see any harm that's been in the record with regard to anything but what we know of today. And even though um, you're, you want to expand the scope, and you said with some rationales why it should be, I didn't see how it's currently affecting consumers now I mean, we've seen in other contexts like for a jailbreaking that over 25,000 people signed a petition how jailbreaking your mobile device helps them but I didn't see anything here from any kind of consumers who say I need to unlock my tablet to use it on another network for some other reason. Bruce, I, mean, I, I agree with that. I'm not aware of any evidence in the record addressing this and that's one of the main points we made. Carson's question uh, that uh, there is any confusion about the scope of the current exemption. And I think it's quite clear that the intent is that an iPad is not a wireless telephone handset, as that term is not used. And along those lines, have you seen any activity in the bulk reselling context that people want to unlock their tablets or e readers or anything else to be used in other countries? purposes that you are concerned about with in terms of the voice devices that you sent? I don't know the answer to that. I have not personally seen it, but that it's not wrong to that it's not out there, so the best answer is I don't know the answer to that. Okay. Mr. Barry, which of the which of the comments did you say there was a footnote talking about some Samsung Samsung tablets? Um uh, in the PCS conference. Yeah, I we, we couldn't figure out if it was Metro PCS or none of them, but we will we'll find it. I just wanted to add for just a moment that uh, many tablet devices are also have telephone numbers assigned to them by, by the uh, carrier. So it's not entirely, it's not as clear as, um, it's, it's not as clear as Mr. Joseph indicated that a tablet is necessarily not a handset. 
Can you make a phone call? Over yeah. a for sure. Yeah, but I, I think uh, David has the, the absolute right question. The fact that a phone <coughs> number is or is not assigned or the type of device identifier that's assigned is a recurring question. Is the device designed to make a telephone call apart from the addition possibly an over the top voice application and the patterns that we're talking about here don't connect to the telephone voice <coughs> communications network and whether they have a phone number or not, that phone number is not callable as part of the telephone network. I, you know, may, I did, did start to Exchange of data right now is a telephone call. Whether it's voice or it's text or it's data, or it's a picture or whatever, that's essentially a telephone call. That's what your <coughs> telephones, wireless telephones, do today. And uh, uh, it strikes me that, uh, that the, uh, the progression of technology and the march uh, forward is, is is happening at a rapid pace. The fact that you have a tablet that can do all those things and also do a lot more. Uh, it doesn't necessarily disqualify it as a, a, a non-telephonic device. Um, I, I, you know, we're, we're getting, I, I think you're getting uh, telecommunications law and the definitions under Title II or Title I or Title III uh, a little uh, uh, confused a little with some copyright law. I, I think this narrow exemption is, is fairly focused and very narrow, and we're talking about devices that can wireless devices that communicate. Uh, with each other through a uh, wireless network. And whatever the device is, uh, given the technology that we're moving to, uh, they make telephone calls um, in a whole different variety of versions and flavors and, 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 and I think qualify uh, similarly um, uh, as your, your description of a voice uh, call. I, um, it, it bothers me that, uh, um, that you focus on that when, in fact, um, it, it, it's more the, the 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 technology that is going to use data to turn that into whatever you want to call as a communication to another person. But I think what we're learning here is that uh, if we recommend an exemption this time around, we're going to have to very look carefully look at the records, see what the evidence is with respect to current blocking practices, see if there, see if there is any evidence of what is likely to happen in the next three years, and our jurisprudence pretty clearly says that means more likely than not, and shape this, the, the class with what the record tells us in mind, and we'll see what the record tells us on that. So for, for you, Bruce, I read in the Wall Street Journal, I have it right here from May 7th, there was an article in the Marketplace section called Carriers chip away at phone subsidies. And it seems to indicate that one of the um, trends for the next three years at least is that more and more carriers are taking back the control of the device from others in the chain, such as Apple, and using the cost of the device as a means by which to retain the customer because if you're spending $700 for an iPhone, for as it is unlocked, that would be more of an incentive for you to stay with that particular carrier. So I'm trying to gather some information from you about where this whole argument about subsidies is going and whether or not this article is in fact indicative of the trend that there'll be less and less subsidies going forward in the next couple of years. Because that seems to be your basis upon which you're concerned about with regard to your clients at CTIA. to admit to being at something of a disadvantage because I haven't seen the article to which you're referring. And I think discretion and wisdom would say that it would be better for me to respond to that question in writing right. after the hearing if you would be amenable to that. Because as I sit here, I don't think I have an answer. No, that's in the fact, I'm pretty sure I don't have an answer. <laughs> no, that's quite all right. I just want to see what the trend is in terms of the business practices and the models going forward with regard to what subsidies are for the 
before I was smart with plants. This really piqued my interest. I understand you don't have something to respond to in time, but I thought maybe you had some general idea based on what you're speaking to with your clients of where things may well be going. I don't. I don't have any knowledge that I mean, consumers, again, this is a consumer choice, and consumers have shown that they like getting the discount, uh, the subsidy permits. And so I'm not aware of any information suggesting that they are going away, but you know, better than my money speculating on the record. I'm going to get back to one. Sure, I, I completely understand that. Some other questions with regard to what is in the record, and that has to do with the use of precedent. I'm seemingly confused by CTA's comments because at one point you say we should not rely upon what the register has done in the past, yet in terms of both reselling and used phones, you say we should definitely use that as a model to go forward if we do have an exemption for this particular class. So give me an idea of what we should be doing in terms of how we view precedent in the 1201 movement and proceedings. Sure. Uh, on issues of fact, I believe the law is clear that this is a de novo proceeding and the burden is on proponents to freshly adduce facts. With respect to issues of law and the statutory construction, Prior decisions of the register presumably have persuasive effect, but not binding effect, to the extent they are believed to be correct. I believe, for example, in the context of the reversal of the presumption on Section 117, uh, we have demonstrated, I hope persuasively, that the register's reversal of that burden uh, as a result of presumption that flew in the face of the register's own recognition of prevailing practice was incorrect as a matter of law and that you would not do that again. But I don't believe the prior determination is binding, it ought to be persuasive. Uh, I do believe that to the extent, again, we have to focus on where the burden of persuasion and where the burden of production is in this proceeding and it rests firmly on the other side and to the extent sufficient evidence uh, that goes beyond what they did last time. I would expect you to do uh, certainly no more than you did last time. We believe that the evidence was insufficient last time, and that once again, that would not justify an exemption. Finally, uh, as an administrative body, you are obligated to be consistent across classes, and to the extent, for example, that you apply a level of harm with respect to, say, uh, DCSS to pick a, or, or DVD protection, you ought to apply, you ought to not apply a different, less favorable uh, conclusion or, at, or level of harm with respect to other types of copyright awards. So I, I think there are a number of factors that play. Uh, okay. Now a question for Laura. I didn't see any comments in your replies about CTIA's proposed exemption. What would you think of the fact that, that we decided to adopt the language that was proposed? How would you respond to that? And before Bruce interjects, we understand they're not really proposing that we adopt it, but uh, it's, right. it's, it's what they might be willing to live with if we went anywhere. Well, I'll go beyond that. I'd say that we would be willing to live with it, and you know, it's, it's actually somewhat So, what's the response in the proponent side? I'm sorry, I don't have a copy of that language. Okay. Well, in, in general, it's um, I think someone behind you has it to share. It was, it was not not just the specific language, but the general propositions that were laid out. Um, given that there's a opponent that's willing to concede particular language for an exemption for individuals, such as what you described when you were traveling, um, why would you seemingly object to something like that if it provides you the relief that you would seek? So, so for 
forgive me. I, I, this is just off the cuff right now. I'm looking at this. I think one of the concerns that I would have is undertaken by an individual <coughs> customer of a wireless service provider. So that means if I'm not already a customer of a wireless provider, I can't unlock my phone. So, you know, I don't know how that would work. So if Laura gives me her phone and I haven't decided what provider I want, if I unlock the phone, it's, it won't, this wouldn't apply to me. Um, not commercial purposes, I think a lot about, you know, what does that really mean and what if I use my, I mean, I work for Consumer Union, my phone, my personal phone is also my work phone. Right. What happens in that case? Um, they well, don't give me a phone, you know, I don't, Consumer Union doesn't provide me a service. But certainly I don't mean to um, impose upon you at this time <laughs> um, your, your learned um, advice here, but I just wanted to get that general feeling as to how you would feel about something that something a opponent could look with. Well, don't let her up so easy. This was in the initial comments. It's fair game to get their reaction to it now, and, and, and if they can't react to it, then we'll react to it on our own. <laughs> There's just something, you know, I by reading the record, seeing some of the gaps, and that's why I'm asking you these questions today and trying to reconcile any contradictions or omissions is one of our missions here in this hearing, so we can make the record Right. even better than it is today. Yes, and I definitely appreciate the opportunity. So, you know, this is, I have not had a chance to fully review, but I would say that those would be two of my concerns looking at this. Um, at the moment, I do appreciate Mr. Joseph suggesting language, but I do think there are some concerns. Mr. Berry, do you have any um, comments here? Um, uh, yes. Um, I, uh, as, as as you know, it's not exactly what uh, I or we have suggested. Uh, I think there's at least three or four different versions out there. Um, I would like to respond to this uh, in writing, if you if you would. I think there's a couple uh, issues that, that are raised by this, some of which uh, uh, we've discussed previously in our uh, discussion on 117. I think uh, raises serious concerns about um, their definition here. I would prefer, uh, obviously, the recommendation we you know, we made to you. Uh, I think um, the way it's drafted right now, for me, especially the conversation we had this morning, um, uh, believe I, I believe that there are uh, potential hidden traps there that would you know, maybe confuse and 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 uh, provide uh, you know easy efforts to frustrate uh, the uh, implementation of the exemption. So I'd like to respond to that in, in detail. I understand that. And I, and I just have one more question for both of you here. That's in regard to your copyrightability argument that you make in your opening brief. Explain to me exactly what you mean by that. Are you talking about copyrightability of the firmware that is the lock itself? And for you, Bruce, you didn't seem to suggest that their argument was entirely wrong, but you said something like, it, leave it to the courts to decide whether or not the firmware that locks the phone is copyrightable. So with that in mind, please present your arguments on that particular <coughs> defense as to why this would be a non-infringing use. Right, we were referring, we were saying that these elements are not copyrightable. We were referring to particular elements in the that are used to connect to the various networks. So, so those are the just the particular elements that limit the connectivity to one or uh, some limited number of networks, and that changing those particular elements of the firmware therefore is an implementation. Now, is, is this a code we're talking about in the, in the firmware? Is it the yes. firmware is a computer program? I'm just trying to wrap my head around what it means when you're saying it's not copyrightable. I'm sorry, what, what, what was your distinction? Are we talking code? about lines of code, or are we talking about a computer program that is in fact the firmware itself that locks the phone to the particular network? We're talking about lines of code um, that uh, in order to or to alter, alter the firmware to enable it to connect to a different network, the, um, the person reflashing the device has to replace some of those elements in the code Different elements, and that those elements themselves, just those mere elements, are not copyrighted. My understanding from 
past rulemaking, I just want to make sure my understanding is correct, is that what you're really talking about is simply changing some data, which is the data that says go to this network and this network alone. Instead, you can change it to say go to that network. Is, is that what we're talking about, or are we talking about something different? Right, that's, that's basically what we're talking about. And I believe that the register in the past, um, register at the time, Register Peters, used the, uh, the analogy to the Happy Birthday song, where uh, you can imagine that the Happy Birthday song is a piece of code, and that just the name is a variable that can be replaced with a different name. And I think that that was a good analogy, helpful in this context for someone like me to know the technologies. I think between the act of unlocking and the use of the operating system software after it has been unlocked. And I believe that there are a certain there are certain locks and or means of circumventing locks for which you do not need to do something that is infringing to accomplish the unlock. And there are other types where the way unlocking is commonly accomplished does require the creation of an infringing modification. But that begs the question of whether the use, whether the operating system software that is thereupon used is copyrightable. And I am aware of nothing in the record to suggest that it isn't. So the short answer is, it is given the absence of proof to the contrary. And the loading of that software would, that is not, to the extent that it is not authorized by license, would be infringing. Thanks for the responses, David. Yeah, I'd follow up on that. Uh, I understand you argue about the reproduction, but let's say that the only changes you're making are literally there's a change in a code that directs you to, instead of going to Verizon, you're going to Sprint or whatever. Um, under those circumstances, is it your argument that there is an additional it is an infringement of an additional exclusive right beyond the reproduction right. Re reproduction right when what is all that is all that is altered is a bit of data like that. No, that is not. I am not arguing that there is. In that case, as you have described, I am not arguing that there is an infringement of the adaptation right. Okay. You seem to be suggesting that there might, with respect to some of the operating system software and some of the cell phones, you might have to do actually more, which which might rise to that level. Is that correct? And that is my understanding. For example, it's my understanding that the most common means of unlocking an iPhone is modifying the bootloader software so that it doesn't engage in authentication, and that. <coughs> substituting a simple indicator of where the, uh, the phone is allowed to connect. And that, that would constitute an infringement. The use of that or the accomplishment of that would constitute the creation of an infringement. Okay, anyone on the other side have any, any, any views to offer on, on that latter point about the fact that at least with respect to the iPhone, uh, you would in fact be creating an unauthorized version? Subject perhaps to 117, that's an issue on which or, we have disagreement. Right, and, and <clears throat> that's probably my answer is that, um, that, I, that you need the exemption to, to unlock. The, the, the degree of, of what you have to do to unlock varies by device. It may vary by uh, uh, the, um, the process that, the, that the, either the manufacturer or the, the carrier that <coughs> requested the device uh, so that it could be more complicated just a, than just a set of data that unlocks it and it's good to go. It may actually uh, also have other uh, uh, other uh, series of data uh, that needs to be replaced in order to not only put it on the network but actually let it uh, work and authenticate on another network. And to that extent, uh, my view would be to the extent that you have to do that and we're only talking about 
accessing and putting it on another network so it can actually function in the same way it functioned on the other network, it would be covered by 117. So uh, I, uh, I understand the dancing on the head of the pin uh, on the, the extent of uh, uh, the unlocking requirement, and I suspect that uh, if you do not extend the exemption that we have here, um, we will have even more complicated uh, you know, versions of software and, and, uh, and efforts to, to frustrate um, this opportunity for consumers to take their device. And I, I just want to add that we're still we're still talking about a mere segment of the operating system that is essentially functional in nature, and, um, and in which there are very limited modes of expression. So I think that this still may not may not be the type of alteration that would rise to the level of, uh, of creativity or expression necessary to constitute a trip of work. No, I don't think. Let me ask you a couple questions about the, uh, the narrower uh, alternative that you put forward. Uh, first of all, um, you talk about this being permitted when circumvention is undertaken by an individual customer of a wireless service provider. And I read that to mean a current customer. So if I was a Verizon subscriber and my contract expired um, and I'm no longer connected to Verizon, I would not be privileged to take advantage of this exemption was that was that an intended uh, uh, an intended component of, of your uh, of what you're putting forward? Now I get back to you after. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, it, it's it's a fair question, and I don't believe you know I, I believe that a prior customer, uh, and, and indeed if you look at the carrier unlocking policies, they typically do also apply. Next question, um, reading on, you talk about a customer, uh, customer who owns the copy of the computer program. Now, if I understand your other arguments, the customer is never going to own the copy of the computer program. So don't we really have an old set here? Given that the entire basis on which the argument is being made, and I, I realize that there's an argument of misuse, but I believe the argument prohibition on the term that said that you have infringement would uh, is simply not copyright misuse and, and you would not find it to be so. But it's based on section 117. That actually carries forward a limitation that the copyright office, that the register and the librarian included in the prior uh, rule. And it is possible that there will be owners. I'm not aware of them. I Consistent with the exemption as the register recommended it in the librarian adopted it last time. Yeah, and one reason we recommended it last time around was we couldn't figure out who the owner is, and, and the law was in such disarray that we decided, fine, we'll put that language in there. And if you have, if it turns out you were the owner of the copy, you get the benefit of it. And if, you, if it turns out you weren't, then you don't. Well, with respect, I don't think that's why you included it last time. And the reason you included it last time was the only non-infringing use on which the register relied was section 117, and an absolute prerequisite of the applicability of section 117 is ownership of the copy of the copyrighted work. I understand that, but I'm saying as we crafted the language, one thing that was in our mind was we don't really know who falls within this because the law is so unclear. Um, but uh, notwithstanding that, what I think I'm taking away from this is if we were to, if we were to adopt this particular language, it would be the position of your clients that none of your subscribers could ever fall within this. Is that correct? I don't know that that would be their position. Remember, they have not sued individual consumers who have unlocked their phones. They may forbear. They're likely <coughs> to forbear. Uh, it would be, uh, I think, their position that this exemption
to the extent that the terms of service remain as they are set forth in our contract, we don't, in our comments, we don't know where the terms of service might go in the future. And it may be that, that a court would find that certain companies' terms of service actually do transfer ownership. But again, it's tied into your, you know, the section, we need to find a non-infringing use in order for this proceeding to proceed at all. And the one on which you replied last time was section 117, and this is an absolute requirement of section 117. Any questions? Maybe a couple. I want to get back to, since we're talking about the scope of the exemption, and switch for a second to the other side in terms of expanding the scope of the current exemption. And if I'm understanding the argument that we're, the difficulty is that defining or the concept of when we're talking about a telephone now seems to, is broad. But some of the examples 